Well, I see that we still have people joining, but I do want to get going for everyone that's already joined. Uh, welcome. I'm Autumn Lintz, the Education Manager here at the Foundation. I want to thank you for joining us for our Answers from the Experts webinar. Before we get started, I just want to do a little housekeeping. So we will be asking questions using the Q&A tool in Zoom, so please submit your questions. I do have questions that were submitted ahead of time, and I will read off of those as time permits. We will be recording this, so please uh, note that we are recording it, and then it will be posted out on our YouTube channel within a few days. And uh, what we want to do is thank our individual donors and our funding partners. We uh, appreciate uh, all the donations. Without the donations, we wouldn't be able to do this. At the end of the webinar, there will be a survey, and I would really appreciate it if you could fill out that survey. So I want to introduce our panelists today. We have Dr. Stefan Barda, who leads the T-cell lymphoma program at the University of Pennsylvania, where he collaborates closely with a multidisciplinary team of cutaneous lymphoma experts. We also have Dr. Jennifer Villasanova Park, who is a member of the University of Pennsylvania Cutaneous T-cell lymphoma program and specializes in the diagnosis and management of patients with cutaneous lymphoma. So I am going to welcome Dr. Park. We are a little behind with Dr. Barda, so we're gonna keep an eye out for him for when he gets here. And when he gets here, we will join him into, oh, I see that Dr. Barda is backstage. So I believe Dr. Barda, if you can hear me, you need to click on the little webinar door to go from the backstage to join us in the webinar. And there you are, there welcome. You are. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but it looks like I'm just on time. Yes, you are just on time. You just missed a little bit of the introductions. So uh, I wanna say welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, we did have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. So we will start with these questions. And then as everyone, who is watching has questions, please just go ahead and add them in using the Q&A tool. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with this first uh, and make a general statement. When we are asking questions of the doctors, they're giving us responses based on their experiences with their patients. So please keep in mind, this is not a second opinion. This is just based on their experiences. And you should always discuss your options with your treating physicians. So with our first question, uh, we have, with my cosis fungoides inactive due to several years of phototherapy, my question is, should I continue twice a month forever? Yeah, that's a, um, if I could answer that, that's a great question. Um, so you can certainly continue. Um, so the question is whether, um, you know, phototherapy as maintenance therapy is necessary. Um, for my patients in, in my practice, um, I usually take into account a lot of things, whether um, their disease is stable um, or, and or clear, um, whether it's a financial or kind of a burden in terms of time to come in for phototherapy, um, the time of the year, um, and you know, whether and if the patient is willing to continue to do so. Um, there's not, there's, it's, you know, the data is, there's not like clear guidelines in terms of um, specific maintenance protocols following for phototherapy for patients with MF. Um, so, you know, for my patients, I, I usually try to get them as clear as possible and then kind of stabilize them on phototherapy. And then if they're, you know, stable and or clear, um, I, you know, we talk about whether it makes sense for them to continue maintenance therapy, um, twice weekly um, phototherapy. And um, if it's around summertime, I usually tell patients to, you know, take a break off phototherapy if it makes sense for them and to get natural sunlight because um, that could be sufficient for them. And by then a lot of patients are um, willing to take that break. Um, but it's really kind of a decision that's made between you and the physician that um, is treating you 
Um, but in my practice, again, I tend to um, discuss that with the patient and see um, you know, whether they're stable or clear um, and whether it makes sense financially in terms of time for them to, to continue to do so, uh, to continue maintenance therapy. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, our next question, do I need flow cytometry tests, <clears throat> excuse me, every time I get checked or should I just get the physical exam of lymph nodes, et cetera? And if that presentation is abnormal, should I then get the blood work done? Yeah, maybe I can take a stab at that question and then I'd like to also hear what uh, what Dr. Park uh, um, has, is, is doing with her patient. But in general, um, flow cytometry does look at whether there is blood involvement in patients with um, cutaneous T cell lymphomas. As you, you probably all know, it's a disease that can affect different compartments, the skin, the lymph nodes and um, viscera or other organs in, and the blood. Um, we do recommend for most patients with the exception maybe of um, very early stage patients with stage 1A disease, to get peripheral blood flow cytometry checked at the time of diagnosis as part of the staging. Um, and, and if patients at that point in time have early stage disease and do not have significant blood involvement, we for early stage patients usually don't routinely um, follow this on a regular schedule, a surveillance schedule. Um, so really not every time that uh, uh, patients come in for an exam or to be checked. We do check it at times when there is a significant progression um, to see whether now it's the progression is not only in, for example, the skin, but also in the other compartment. So that's a time where for patients who initially have negative um, uh, blood involvement or no blood involvement, where we would uh, check it. Uh, then, of course, we have the patients who have significant blood involvement, and, you know, we categorize it as B0, means no significant blood involvement, B1, um, and B2. B2, it's it's more than 1,000 uh, cesare cells. Um, and there we do follow the cesare count regularly, and particularly in response to therapy, um, to, to assess how our therapy is working. So that's uh, um, another scenario. We usually don't um, check it too often. We usually check it every three to four months at, 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 at most. Um, and again, in patients who have achieved clearance of their blood, which is now thankfully with many of the newer uh, therapies, um, uh, 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 great possibility, then we also would not check it necessarily that often, but only then uh, when we try to restage either at times of progression or we even see something in the blood count or maybe once a year or so. And then we have everything in between where people have some minimal blood involvement. And again, there, uh, there, there's no really clear guideline as to how, how often it should be checked. And it depends on, on the discussions um, between you and your physician whether you're on a systemic therapy or not, uh, what these counts have been doing as to how often um, it should be checked, but usually no more often than uh, three to four months in, in patients who have blood involvement. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, for staging purposes, um, as you know, Dr. Barta is on uh, the NCCM guidelines uh, lymphoma panel. And we use that quite regularly when we um, think about staging our patients. So, so typically in CDCL, um, if you have minimal skin involvement, the likelihood of there being blood involvement is extremely rare and very low. So for our early stage patients, we don't routinely check. Um, I will sometimes check uh, molecular in the blood um, to see if there's a circulating clone that matches the skin. Um, so we'll check a clone in the skin if they, if, you, if they have significant disease and see if there's a clone in the blood. Um, and at that point, if I have concern, potentially checking flow, but, um, and that's only in the early stage patients. Um, but typically for patients who have significant skin disease, um, you know, um, greater than 10% body surface um, area involvement, presence of plaques, um, erythrodermic, 80% um, um, body surface involvement, 
um, I will certainly include that in the staging process as per the, the NCCN guidelines. Um, and then in terms of how often, um, and Dr. Barda mentioned this kind of the staging breakdown for blood, B0, B1, B2. Um, so if patients have anywhere from um, you know, significant B1 to B2, um, we typically check every three to four months um, to assess um, for um, response to therapy. Um, we'll, we'll also check um, should there be any sort of signs of progression um, on the skin or anywhere else. Um, but that's, I, I, I agree, that's typically how we, how we do things. That's some really wonderful information, thank you. So our next question, uh, I have been diagnosed and living with mycosis fungoides for over 12 years. Light therapy and steroid creams have been enough to keep me in check until now. However, as I get older, I notice a difference in the speed of its return and wonder if there's blood work that should be done several times a year to understand and better control my skin rashes. Kind of ties in with the previous question. Yeah, so um, do you wanna go ahead, <laughs> uh, Dr. Park, to? Um, sure, um, I guess, you know, just in general, um, it's, uh, you know, there are some details left out in the question in terms of um, how often, um, but, you know, I would discuss that with your physician. I, I don't know what body surface area you have um, and what you what exactly you mean by, um, um, you know, time to get better following phototherapy. Um, but again, you know, if if you have um, significant body surface area involvement, presence of plaques, um, kind of more signs of progression clinically, then I think it would be important to check blood involvement. Um, if you have any kind of itching that's out of proportion to your um, clinical exam, um, then that's also another reason to check um, blood involvement. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I think uh, it ties in very well with the prior questions and how it was answered that if there are signs of progression, we don't only check the compartment where there is the uh, progression, so the skin, we do always periodically then check um, other areas. Now, it probably also depends a little bit um, where you live and who follows you and whether you're followed both by a medical oncologist and a dermatologist. Um, given that medical oncologists uh, do like to check blood a, a lot more frequently <laughs> based on a, a lot of the other patients they're seeing. So you're probably um, more likely to have your blood checked um, as part of your visit when you see uh, the medical oncologist. And I'm not saying that's better or worse, that just <laughs> I think is, is, is a fact how, of how, how the treatment patterns are slightly different. And um, we do can at least in part also get a bit of an idea of uh, the blood involvement by looking at a blood count and looking at the breakdown of your white blood cell count and the lymphocyte count. So we do that also um, not infrequently um, because that's a lot faster in turnaround than the uh, flow cytometry. Uh, so it's kind of the poor man's test. Um, but in general, um, you know, it, it's, it's a clinical um, decision in based on the pace of the progression, the significance of the progression, and, the, and, and, and all these risk factors that Dr. Park had mentioned as to um, how likely are you to have blood involvement, uh, how often we, we do test this. I will also add that if you're being followed by um, your dermatologist um, primarily, that you should at least have basic blood work checked yearly. That's um, depending on how much involvement you have on the skin. So just uh, like a metabolic profile, cell count, LDH, at least yearly. That, that's a great comment. I agree Thank you that. both for that. Uh, can physical stress such as weightlifting, jogging, and et cetera, cause breakouts? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I always counsel my patients. I don't know of any data that suggests that. Um, you would think that it would make you feel healthy overall by doing all those things. Um, but I... I, I like to counsel my patients to take care of their skin in general, just moisturizing and keeping healthy, but I don't know of any specific data for that. Yeah, I mean, there is, sometimes people describe it as youth stress or distress, <laughs> that's the Greek words for positive stress or negative stress. So I would think that physical exercise is a positive stress. <laughs> so it makes actually people happy. Um, we, 
um, and and then there's of course uh, other negative stress factors and and there is some circumstantial evidence that probably um, stress does influence your immune system. I don't think that's been well established, but we, we probably all know uh, when we get run down, you're more likely to break out, for example, with cold sores, which is a sign that your immune system is down. So uh, we do think that the immune system does present a significant uh, role in, in, in uh, controlling cancer and particularly also um, mycosis fungoid or Cesare syndrome. So one could say that if you're under a lot of stress, I wouldn't be entirely surprised that you might have a little bit of a flare. Um, but in general, I would also, like Dr. Park, advise my, my patients to stay physically active and physically healthy. I mean, one other concern may be, of course, that sweating, excessive sweating, and, and uh, may lead to somewhat of a, an exacerbation with tight, wearing tight clothes, etc. So that's the only other connection I could, <laughs> I could make. Um, but in general, I'm all for staying physically and mentally uh, healthy and happy. Okay, hey, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so this one is kind of a multi-part, so I'm going to work through it all, and then if you need me to go back and to repeat anything. So the patient has mycosis fungoides stage 1A. They've been started on uh, Larega, which they've been doing after about 10 weeks is working well and is doing well on the plaques on the torso and limbs. Um, they're specifically asking about the scalp. Can, can it be applied on the scalp? And then with that, their dermatologist did also recommend beta methasone on the scalp. So they're asking if it's safe to combine the two and or are there any other treatments that you would recommend if your patient had uh, scalp issues? What was the first um, medication you mentioned? I missed that. Ladaga, Ladaga, I always say it wrong. Chloro, chloromethine, chloromethine. Oh, methchlor, oh. L-E-D-A-J-G-A. -A. I don't know what that is. Um, nitrogen mustard, is that what you're asking about? It could be, uh, I'll, 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 I'm gonna use the Google um, Ladega to see what the other name is. Uh, Cause it sounds like it could be. So I apologize, that was not one that I was familiar with. Um, it's a European, it is, Oh, it, it, yeah, I think it's it's like nitrogen mustard. Okay, it's like nitrogen mustard. Got yeah, met metchlorethamine. Um, yes. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with the brand name. I guess that's the uh, European brand name. Yeah, Meclofor. Yes, he they didn't have the ME for Mecla. So, yeah, so that's what it is. Um. So the question is whether it's safe to use both at the same time. And also put it on your scalp. So, um. When I um, treat my patients with nitrogen mustard gel, um, I'll have patients, I actually, you know, I'll actually have them use it concurrently with topical steroids with, of which beta methasone is one. Um, so nitrogen mustard at night to the patches and then the topical steroid during the day. Um, I guess I'm assuming that the patient doesn't have hair on the scalp to make, to allow it to be applied. Um, otherwise, I don't know how uh, easy it would be to apply to the scalp. Um, I would I would say that, um, you know, nitrogen mustard, um, you know, what we know about is that 30% of patients can get a contact dermatitis or, you know, irritant versus allergic. Um, and so that kind of limits its use. So a lot of people have very kind of exuberant contact um, dermatitis reactions from it. Um, this is part of the reason why I also um, prescribe a topical steroid at the same time. Um, I have not used it on patient scalp. Um, so thank you, you know, as long as it's away, uh, applied away from the, the eyes, then I think it should be okay. But I, I personally have not used it on the scalp. Betamethasone I've used um, as a solution applied to the scalp, depending on how much hair the patient has. And then the other piece of it, was there any other treatments that you recommended for the scalp? Right, so um, a lot of the topical steroids come in various formulations. So I usually try to use a form, uh, you know, either a solution 
Um, there are oil-based topical steroids that can be applied um, in hair bearing areas that are much easier to work with. Um, and um, also gel formulation. So, you know, you know, topical steroids um, are typically kind of the mainstay for the for the scalp area. Okay. And thank you for figuring out what it was that we were asking about. <laughs> uh, so our next question has to do with MOGA. They have been on continuous treatment with MOGA since October of 2020, and they've had six previous protocols. They're doing well and have had a complete response and spacing treatments to seven weeks apart now. But they have begun experiencing muscle and joint pain while all inflammatory markers are normal. Have you had this experience with any of your patients? And if so, uh, what was your suggestion? So mogamolizumab is an excellent drug and I'm, I'm glad the, uh, the patient who was asking the question had such an excellent response. I mean, that's really wonderful to hear. Um, and uh, we do face uh, this problem now a, a lot more often than before that we have uh, patients on drugs uh, that uh, in clinical trials have been used in 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 a time limited fashion and and it's not clear entirely how long we use uh, are supposed to use this drug. So there are uh, variations in uh, provider preferences, meaning, uh, some providers stop after a certain period of time, um, and some providers continue, and um, and our practice has been based on the response to continue, but then to lengthen the times in between the infusions. And there are clinical trials also looking at that strategy to formally assess whether that's a, a, a feasible strategy. What I would say is if we can establish that the symptoms that the patient is experiencing are related to the mogamolizumab and the patient has achieved an excellent response to the therapy, it may be worthwhile to consider a treatment break. Um, sometimes, so uh, we do know that mogamolizumab can be associated with autoimmune disorders. Um, and we certainly there can be some unusual autoimmune disorders, and some of them might not have been captured in in the clinical trial. So there are always some uh, side effects that might occur uh, at a later stage, which is why, for example, the FDA collects a lot of this information uh, when drugs have been approved. But um, I think uh, an appropriate workup to see whether there is an inflammatory component, and it sounds like uh, the patient had that workup. Um, is indicated, and if nothing else can be established, and um, and the patient continues to have an excellent response, particularly in the blood um, and the skin, and uh, I, I I think a treatment holiday might be a good idea. Figuring it out because if these symptoms disappear, um, then it uh, it may be connected. Clearly, we only would know if we then rechallenge and they. <laughs> occur again, truly, if if the mogamolizumab is uh, a factor. But but as there is no clear evidence supporting indefinite use of mogamolizumab, I think a treatment holiday would be what I probably would advise. But again, I, I don't have the full picture. And um, I, it sounds like uh, there have been many prior clinical trials uh, or, or um, um, regimens that have been tried. So um, it, it it, it sounds like probably that is the reason why the drug is being continued because it might have been hard to um, keep keep a remission in the past. So that that has to be taken into account. But um, a drug holiday certainly is is something uh, one could discuss at this point. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question, there's kind of a two parter, and I'm going to ask you guys to answer the first, and then I'll come back with the second. So her mother was recently diagnosed with possible but highly suspected either cesary or mycosis fungoides. The provider stated that it's most likely cesary. So she understands that everyone's disease is different. There's no cure. Um, haven't, hasn't seemed to have gotten a lot of information, but is looking overall the prognosis or life expectancy with cesary and then does cesary also have stages? 
So Cesare is essentially a stage of my mycosis fungoides. So there have been, um, so there's growing support that Cesare disease is probably a different disease than mycosis fungoides. It may come from a uh, different cells, but um, this has not been fully established. And at this point in time, we do lump them all together under mycosis fungoides stage one uh, to four. And then we have four, uh, 1A, 1B, 3A, 3B. We have then 4A, 4B. We have 4A1, A2, A3. So it gets very complicated. And Cesare disease is essentially stage um, four uh, a, a, a one disease. So it, it falls within the category of... Um, mycosis fungoides, but in a way behave slightly differently. Um, we do know that, for example, certain drugs work better in Cesare syndrome um, than in other stages of mycosis fungoides, for example, tumor stage mycosis fungoides. Um, so it, it is important to differentiate that, and, and, and the differentiation is mainly in the clinical picture, so whether there is um, we call that erythroderma, so uh, full skin involvement or skin involvement of more than 80% of the body surface area. And we assess the body surface area um, by, well, there are various ways of doing it. An easy way is to look at one owns palm and that, that uh, and hand. So this is half a percent. This is 1% of my body surface area. Uh, every patient, of course, with their size has, uh, but, but that's one way to assess it. And then, of course, also the amount of blood involvement. And usually these patients have what's called B2 blood involvement um, with um, at least 1,000 Cesare cells. Uh, and often we also see some lymph node involvement that may be uh, reactive, um, but certainly we can see that on the scan and we usually, if we see an abnormally appearing lymph node um, here at, at Penn, we do advise a, a biopsy. So at this point in time, what I advise, would advise is maybe um, getting um, the all the data reviewed at a center that has experience um, with diagnosing and, and treating this rare disease, uh, because it can be sometimes quite challenging. Um, so that would be one. Uh, the other thing is that, yes, we see Cesare syndrome as higher risk than many other stages uh, of mycosis fungoides. On the other hand, um, many of the new drugs that we have now in, in development particularly work very well for Cesare syndrome. Um, so a lot of the numbers that you may find on the internet and in other publications um, probably are no longer thankfully accurate and we have seen um, better outcomes for patients. Um, the other thing is always to um, think about that when one looks at curves, um, one looks at statistical probabilities and, and every patient is different. And while there may be a higher probability that the disease may not respond to the therapy initially and more intensive therapy may be needed, um, every patient is different. And in the end, what determines um, the outcome is often how patients and their disease um, respond and tolerate the, the, the treatment. And um, we can see even with Cesare syndrome, uh, some excellent outcomes with these uh, newer therapies. Um, but yeah. I know it's a but complicated, a long question. And certainly I think getting the diagnosis right initially and seeing somebody who has experience um, diagnosing and treating this disease um, will, will be very important. And the, the only thing I would um, add is that, um, so as Dr. Barta said, um, Cesare is defined by presence of erythroderma, so 80% body surface area involvement, B2 blood involvement. Um, so, you know, biopsies of the skin are often non-diagnostic in Cesare patients with erythroderma, um, which is sounds counterintuitive. Um, there, there can be some suspicious findings on biopsy, but it's not as quite as distinct as patients who have patch or plaque or tumor stage disease, um, MF. So it's very, very important to get flow cytometry of the peripheral blood to really um, get that diagnosis of Cesare. So that, that will truly define um, presence of Cesare. And also I wanna to add to the woman that's asking, the foundation website 
has some pretty good information on the stages and in relation to Cesare. So if you want to utilize the, the foundation's website, it has some really good information. And there's also a section that slightly addresses the, the, the last part of her question is, what are the top three questions should I, as her daughter, be asking her provider? So if she only had three questions to ask in the appointment, what should she be asking? What's the Cesare count of her mother? I think that's an important question because you can have um, kind of lower B2 burden versus higher B2 burden. Um, I think that's an important question. Oh, you're on mute, Dr. Right. Dr. Barda. You're muted still. Sorry, part of the... Um... As a medical oncologist, again, part of the staging is usually for uh, patients where we have concern for Cesare syndrome, also uh, um, assessing their lymph node status and organ status. So usually we use a whole body PET CT, and that is also important. Um, if, if that has been done, I would also ask what, what the um, involvement, if is there any involvement of the lymph node, and, and um, how, how are you assessing um, the uh, nodal or what's called visceral or organ involvement. Thank you so much on that. That one was a, a very complex one. I appreciate all the detail. So we have a question from someone they submitted ahead of time, but they are online. But I also want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A. So on this one, we might need a little more information. So I want to try and ask the question. And if it's not something that's clear, we'll ask that she go ahead and uh, state it more clearly in the Q&A tool. Uh, if you've been fairly clear over a year without UVB treatment, uh, occasionally use Lydex, is it possible to still have advanced disease in time? So I think she's asking about progression, currently stage 1A. Um, so in general, stage 1A, um has an excellent prognosis. So people in general do very well. If again, one looks at um, population data, so looking at a lot of people with this diagnosis, usually one would expect that uh, patients do just as well as people who don't have mycosis fungoides. Um, however, there's always exceptions to the rules and these are in captures in, captured in all these big numbers. Um, so there certainly is a risk of um, progression. However, for stage 1A, that is usually uh, lower, but, but then, for example, there are some subtypes that may have a higher uh, risk of progression. For example, the folliculotropic uh, mycosis fungoides, um, maybe one um, uh, such um, uh, uh, instance. And, and again, as, as, as Dr. Park had mentioned, if you have plaques, for example, instead of patches. So there are some features that may um, indicate that there might be a higher risk. But what I would suggest is just um, continuing to follow with, with the dermatologist or the medical oncologist on a regular basis um, uh, to, to have that physical exam. Um, and then as, as Dr. Park pointed out, also um, at some stage, uh, blood tests um, to just make sure that there is no such progression event. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the next one, uh, the question seems to be more that it was thrown out to the group, but I'm going to rephrase it in a way so that it's more of a question that you can ask is, what kind of successes have you had with Bexeratine? And then uh, on her question, was anybody have a full body scan radiation? So I guess I would rephrase that question is, when would that be something that we would want to have done with the patient? So if we want to split it into overall success you've seen with Bexeratine first. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the clinical trials, um, you know, those overall response rates around 30 to 40% with Bexeratine. Um, and in general, that's that's um, what I typically see in my patient population. Um, with regards to when total skin would be appropriate, um, so I think about using total skin in patients, um, you know, depending on what they've tried already, how symptomatic they are, um, 
total skin tends to be um, a pretty fairly quicker acting um, kind of therapeutic that we reach for. Um, so in patients who have, um, who are highly symptomatic, very itchy, have uh, quite a bit of body surface area involvement, um, I, I will typically um, kind of talk about that as an option, um, but it's kind of a shared decision-making process with my patients and what they feel comfortable doing and how symptomatic they are. Um, so if they've failed, you know, all the systemic medications that I've uh, typically offer like Bexerotene or interferon, um, certainly the other skin-directed treatments, then I will um, kind of push that. Um, and then, um, you know, the other thing is if, if um, you know, if they, they don't have um, available access to things like PUVA, which tends to be a little bit more effective than narrowband UVB, and they're again, highly symptomatic. Um, Typically what we do now with total skin is low dose. So that can be kind of something to reach for as well. Yeah, I think um, that's a very comprehensive answer. Absolutely, we do. When we think about uh, total skin electron beam radiation or, or uh, total body uh, radiation, we think also sometimes about uh, what the future may hold for the patient. So. Um, particularly if we have somebody where we think about uh, an allogeneic stem cell transplant um, in, in, in the future where we do know that we also will use um, total skin electron beam therapy prior to the transplant, we'll, we'll have to consider that. Uh, but as Dr. Park has pointed out, we have been using lower and lower doses of uh, uh, total skin body uh, uh, radiation, particularly here at Penn, and those can sometimes be uh, even uh, repeated one uh, or two times in, in patients and be fed, um, uh, often seen very, uh, very good responses, particularly in some patients, as Dr. Park has pointed out, who are highly symptomatic and have um, erythroderma. And um, we often uh, consider this also as part of a multimodality uh, approach, so not only just one therapy. And another important part is that with the total skin uh, radiation, we do know that um, the responses can last a variable amount of time. And we do know that after that, we, we would like patients to receive some form of maintenance therapy to maintain that response for as long as possible. And this just shows how important the multidisciplinary approach in this disease is where the dermatologist um, talks to the radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist. And, um, and then of course also takes into account the patient's opinion. The other thing is availability of total skin electron beam therapy may not be um, the same for wherever one lives in the United States. Um, it can be sometimes very difficult for uh, patients to identify locations, but um, I know that uh, that, that uh, the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation can be very helpful in locating those centers um, that offer this therapy if that ever is considered. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, um, Dr. Barda. And then the other only other thing I would add is. Um, you know, at Penn, we do a lot of multimodality therapy um, and combining total skin with things like interferon can really help potentiate the effects of total skin. And we've seen some really nice response um, with, in terms of kind of stimulating the immune system following radiation. Okay, thank you so much for all of that information. Uh, so we have a couple uh, in regarding some treatments, uh, pros and cons of MOGA. I know we've talked about it already, but they're specifically looking, in your opinion, what are the pros and cons? Well, the pro is um, that it is an immunotherapy. So we are strong believers that modulating the immune system is, is really important in patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. And patients, when they get diagnosed, often are very immunocompromised. If, if one looks at um, the different types of T cells. So the T cells 
prime job is actually to fight off infections and or and or even other cancers and and there should be a whole lot of these different types of t cells that fight different infections when one looks at what's called the t cell repertoire in patients with uh, cutaneous uh, lymphoma and particularly often also cesare syndrome um, all we find often is one type of t cell and that's the um, cutaneous lymphoma t cell and um so, so patients are at the get-go very immunocompromised and are more susceptible to infection. So finding therapies that do not further um, put a strain on the immune system is really important. And, and um, that is the pro of mogamolizumab that it, it does work a, a directly uh, by targeting these um, abnormal cells to the immune system. It helps the immune system identify and destroy them, but it also works in other parts of the immune system and um, kind of take, uh, take some checks of the immune system that the cancer cells have developed to, to keep the immune system quiet or to escape the immune system. So that's another good part of the Mogamolism app. Um, the other... Um, a uh, pro is that it's a very well tolerated drug in 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 general. Um, while it does have a drug a, a rash as a not uncommon side effect, and that certainly can be confusing. This usually can be fairly um, well managed um, by uh, by uh, providers that have experience with this drug. Um, but in general, it is a very well tolerated drug. Um, the um, other, the last pro I would, well, there are several more pros, but one other is that it works extremely well in patients with blood involvement. It's, 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 it's amazing, um, especially compared to when we did not have mogamolizumab around, um, that could have, was often a challenge. And, and in this compartment, it, the mogamolizumab works very well. Um, that brings me also to the cons that, um, A, it, it, of course, it can be a strain on, on patients um, having initially this once a week infusion for five weeks and then every other week. Um, so it's, it's, it can be involved. Um, and the fact that um, it does, well, every drug in, in cutaneous lymphoma works better in one compartment than in the other. So it's not the right drug for every patient, for example. Um, so we have to uh, look at what what the main symptoms of the patients are, which areas are the main ones involved, and how how um, we can treat that best. Um, lastly, I think that though that is another pro, um, one can uh, combine mogamolizumab with other therapies, and that certainly is a is is a pro of. Um, of several other drugs, but certainly uh, we have, as Dr. Park has pointed out, tried uh, other multimodality therapies. So for example, one can combine it with um, photophoresis, one can combine it with um, phototherapy or skin-directed phototherapy, one can combine it with radiation, and, and we, we do combine it with other drugs that can stimulate the immune system. And there might be some synergy, so not just a um, one plus one is two, but there might be um, one plus one is four. <laughs> that we think with uh, combining these uh, immunotherapies, so they they um, really bring out the best uh, in 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 each other. So um, a lot of pros. Um, any 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 drug has cons. Um, the drug rash can be sometimes challenging and may, may require a biopsy. Um, but uh, all in all, I think it's it's been a big advancement in in the armamentarium to have uh, mogamolism ever around. And I want to applaud you to be able to say that so often, so smoothly. <laughs> Every time I try to pronounce the full name for moga, I just trip on it. So I've just given up on that. So I, I really applaud your ability to do that. Uh, so we just have time for a few more questions. So I just wanted to do a time check, and then also anyone that's watching live. If you want to, oh, we just got uh, we just got a big question, but I want to do these three that kind of go together. And we always get these questions, and, and we know uh, it starts off: Can the disease be cured? Um, and we know that's something everyone always wants to ask about. But we have two other questions: That is basically, what is new in treatments, and then how close in our future are successful treatment options for remission? So it all kind of goes together. Is 
can it be cured? And if it can't be cured, what do you see on the horizon that's promising? So maybe I'll take a stab at this question and um, if Dr. Park has something to add, uh, but in, in terms of cure at this point in time, the uh, only modality that we think can cure cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so that is where patients receive the um, blood stem cells from another person. Um, and with that also receive a new immune system. Uh, clearly it has significant risks um, and, and, and works better for some patients than others and may not be an option for patients who have uh, other uh, medical illnesses that increase the risk of uh, side effects from the transplant. So this has always been weighed against each other, the risk um, of having significant uh, complications. Um, and th th some of those are long-term complications and uh, against the benefits. Um, certainly, uh, we are looking into other immunotherapies um, that may have the potential for a cure. So for example, there are some CAR T-cell therapies um, that are being explored in T-cell lymphoma. So these are therapies where the patient's own or, or somebody um, else's um, T-cells or other immune cells, for example, NK cells are being modified to recognize the Cesare cells and then are being infused. So that's slightly different from, uh, the tran from a transplant. Uh, but these are currently just investigational and experimental. And then last but not least, there are always some patients who have an exceptional response to a therapy. For example, um, some patients can have an exceptional response to um, photophoresis and interferon to particularly immune therapies and remain in a remission and never relapse, whether they are cured or not. That's um, then a philosophical question, but is, if one has no disease um, for a very long time and never relapses in their lifetime, that that that's good enough for me. And we can see that sometimes with certain immunotherapies and uh, photophoresis may be one of them with interferon. Some drugs like uh, pembrolizumab can offer some exceptional long-term responses. And even some patients with other therapies um, uh, like, like combination of mogamolizumab, there, there's always when you look at clinical trials, there's always a tail to the curve. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, so we had a question that came through. I actually provided some answers and a written answer for it uh, that I think it might be easier because they were specifically looking for treatments and spellings on things. So I, I did do that in there. So we're on our last question and uh, we've kind of touched on this a little bit already, uh, but I wanna see if we can add to it because um, they're talking about Cesare diagnosis and they're specifically asking about the blood parameters that would lead to it. And does the cytometry indicate it, which we've touched on, and then what are the identifiers? So getting very scientific in the question and wasn't sure if it's something that could just kind of be bullet pointed with your responses that, that makes that clear. If not, I totally understand because as you said before, this is it's very complex to do the diagnosis. Yeah, so um, I could take a stab at that. Um, so we, we use flow cytometry to assess for Cesare cells. Um, and there are um, specific marker. So there's not one specific marker that we look for to find Cesare in flow cytometry. So we look for, um, we look at CD4, the CD4 population of cells. And we look specifically for loss of CD7 and CD26. Um, there are some other um, sort of um, antibodies that could potentially be used um, looking that are you know, specific for T cell um, receptor gene rearrangement that can help with finding clones. But, but typically when we're thinking about counting Cesare cells, we look for the CD4 population and we look at loss of CD7 and CD26. Um, and so to define Cesare, um, you have to have greater than a thousand um, cells that are Cesare, um, so they can be loss of CD7 or CD26, 
Um, you should also have a T cell clone that um, in the blood that um, matches the skin. Um, so um, that's, that's typically how we um, kind of define it by flow cytometry. Okay, thank you so much. So that is our time. I wanna thank both Dr. Barda and Dr. Park for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to answer questions. And before we go, I wanted to ask if you had any parting thoughts for us. Put you on the spot there. Well, I think, um, well, I want to thank the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation for the excellent work that, that, that you are providing, uh, both educational and also other ways of supporting patients, um, supporting research. And um, I would just want to applaud you. And if it weren't for an organization like you, um, uh, I, I'd be very worried <laughs> about some of these very rare diseases where people feel left alone. So I, I, I'm very grateful for that. And we do know and understand um, that it can be a long journey until one is even diagnosed with this disease. Um, and what I would uh, just in general recommend is that probably every patient who is diagnosed with this disease in their lifetime should at least see somebody who has a lot of experience with this disease um, to just make sure that um, the diagnosis is correct and um, that the, the, uh, the treatment is correct, because it can be very, very difficult for um, oncologists or dermatologists who, who don't have the experience to treat su such rare diseases. Um, and the other thing is that um, we've made huge advances in, in, in the treatment of um, mycosis fungoides. And there are now several new drugs in development and new treatment modalities. So I think um, the the way we are treating and the outcomes for patients has changed a lot over the last uh, five to 10 years. And, and there, there's always hope. Um, and, and many things have been explored through clinical trials. So we also always encourage clinical trial participation. So I, I think there was a lot for a parting thought, <laughs> but I'm very passionate. All good things this. though, all good things. Yeah, I, I would just echo what Dr. Barda said and all the good work that the CLF is doing for patients. I always um, make sure that my patients new and new and returning know about CLF and all the, the support and information that you provide to them. So thank you. Well, we can't do it with your guys' support either. So thank you so very much. So uh, my parting thought is thank you for joining us and please do the survey. It, it is very helpful for us to know your thoughts and, and what, uh, what you liked and what you didn't like. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.